This is Dunleary Harbour on the south side of Dublin Bay. It was originally built as a harbour of refuge for sailing ships in distress, but it wasn't always successful. On Christmas Eve 1895, a ship attempted to get into the harbour unsuccessfully and was wrecked on the south side of Dublin Bay. The bay today is very tranquil, but on Christmas Eve in 1895 it wasn't so. It was described as being a seething mass of foam and spray, as far as the eye could see. And waves were coming over the east pier, and spray was washing over the lighthouse. It was the scene of a horrific tragedy when a ship called the Palm attempted to get into Kingstown Harbour to seek refuge. A dreadful tragedy unfolded, resulting in enormous loss of life. It wasn't the crew of the Palm that were lost. All 19 people on board, including the captain's wife and child, were eventually rescued. By one of those awful twists of fate, the entire crew of 15 of the Kingstown No. 2 lifeboat, the Civil Service No. 7, were all lost as they went out to try and effect a rescue. The ship in question was called the Palm, and it was owned in Finland, in Mariham in the Åland Islands, by a member of the famous Eriksson family. It was originally an American-built down a wooden, three-masted sailing vessel, and very, very strongly built. The sailing ship Pam left Maryham in the Holland Islands, which was its home port, on the 19th of December, and went to Liverpool with a cargo of timber. From there, there were no outgoing cargoes, so the ship was going to Mobile in Alabama in ballast to collect a cargo of pitch pine timber. Now, troubles began as they left Liverpool and began to sail down the Irish Sea. They ran into horrific weather. Uh, after three or four days, they had only gotten down as far as the Tusker Rock and they had to turn and run back up the Irish Sea. In the early hours of Christmas Eve morning, the ship was up off the Rockabill Light in North County, Dublin. And the captain made the decision then to run for Dublin Port. And to that end, they turned the ship about and headed westwards, but the visibility got very bad. So he then made the decision to head for Kingstown Harbour and sailed south near to the Kish Lightship and around the south end of the Burford Bank and finished up, anchored off the mouth of Dunleary Harbour. There were sheets of spray coming over the harbour wall, uh, according to one eyewitness account, and the creaking and groaning of the anchor chains could be heard from eyewitnesses who were on the West Pier. Now, the man that took charge of things straight away was Captain the Honourable Francis G. Croft and the harbour master of Kingstown. He took certain steps. The first thing he did was he went aboard his steam launch and went down to see the master of a tug which was moored in the harbour and requested that the tug go out to the assistance of the ship. The master of the tug took one look out at the conditions that prevailed in the bay and refused to go out saying that he wouldn't jeopardise both his vessel and the lives of his crew. Captain Crofton then telephoned to the Clyde Shipping Company, a company that owned a fleet of steam paddle tugs that were used for towing ships in and out of port. These tugs in the photograph are the Flying Sprite and the Flying Swallow. The two steam tugs immediately left Customs House Quay and headed downriver. As soon as they got to the Poolbeg Lighthouse, they had to turn back. Conditions were so bad in the bay that one of the tugs almost turned over. The other one took a sea down the funnel and just barely made it back to port. So when Captain Crofton, the harbour master, heard of this, the tugs returned to port, he decided to send out two lifeboats to the assistance of the ship. The ship at this stage had begun to drift up into the upper reaches of the south side of Dublin Bay and went aground to the place called the Razor Bank, about halfway between the Poolbeg Light and Black Rock Bats, where the seabed shelves up very quickly from about 10 metres to 5 metres. This is the direction in which the palm would have been drifting, past the end of the West Pier here, up into the middle of the south side of the bay, over towards the chimneys, about halfway across. When Captain Crofton heard that the tugs were unable to proceed out into the bay, he made signals summoning the lifeboat men. These were maroon rockets which were fired. The men began to assemble beside the old lifeboat house, which is beside the East Pier. In all, 24 volunteers arrived down at the lifeboat house, and immediately the larger of the two lifeboats 
was made ready for launching. Included in the crew uh, were Alexander and Henry William's father and son, the coxswain and the ex-coxswain of the lifeboat. This is a photograph of one of the older lifeboats, the Hector, and you can see in it how it was kept on a sliding trolley ready for launching in the old lifeboat house. There were two lifeboats on station in Kingstown, the Hannah Picard, which was the smaller of the two and was similar to this one, and the Civil Service Number no. 7, which was identical to this boat. This one is actually called the Dunleary, and it was the boat that replaced the Civil Service Number no. 7 after it was wrecked in Dublin Bay. And this is the photograph of the same boat uh, on the day of its official launch in the Coal Harbour in Kingstown. It was about 42 feet long and powered by sails and by oars, as were all of the lifeboats at that time. All of these lifeboats had been designed by the renowned marine architect and yacht designer George Lennox Watson, and they were built to an extremely high standard. Captain Crofton decided to send out both of the lifeboats that were stationed in Kingstown. Only 24 volunteers had arrived, and as the first 15 of the lifeboat men prepared to take out the Civil Service Number no. 7, he went aboard the guard ship HMS Melampus that was stationed in Kingstown. And he requested, made a request to the captain for volunteers to make up the additional six members of the second lifeboat crew. Uh, it's said that when volunteers were called for, that the entire ship's complement stepped forward. However, six volunteers under Chief Petty Officer Albert Rogers uh, were detailed off to go with Captain Croft and back to the lifeboat house uh, in the ship's steam pinnace. When they got there, the Civil Service Number no. 7 was ready to go and the, the steam pinnace from HMS Melampus towed the Civil Service Number no. 7 down to the mouth of the harbour where they cast off and set the sails. This is the old lifeboat house that now houses the inshore lifeboat. The RLLI was started in 1824, but the Dublin Bay lifeboats weren't subsumed into the RLLI till about 30 years later. This is where the Hannah Picard would have been housed on a trolley. All of the lifeboat gear was kept here, and it was launched down this slipway. The Civil Service No. 7 being a larger boat was usually kept on a mooring near where the present lifeboat is moored. This is the point from where the lifeboat men departed on that last fateful day. It was also the place where all of the equipment was kept and where they would have kitted up before leaving. This is the sort of equipment that was worn by lifeboat men of the day. They would have been wearing oil skins, a cork wrap around life belt, a sou'wester and probably leather sea boots also. And this is the sort of equipment that the men uh, would have been donning as they prepared to go out on the rescue. They set sail and began to proceed in a westerly direction in the, over towards the wreck of the vessel, which at this stage had gone aground and the mast had been cut away. This was standard practice for a sailing ship on the shore. There were a great many eyewitness accounts because people had walked down to the end of the West Pier to see what was happening. Word soon got around that there was a sailing ship aground in the bay. And a great many eyewitness accounts are extant one in particular came from an English-speaking member of the crew of the Palm, who was probably nearest placed to see what had happened. And his account uh, was as follows. He said that when the lifeboat approached the wreck, they lowered the sails and got out the oars and with a, to make an attempt to come around the wreck on the lee side with the intention of taking off the crew. At that stage, a huge wave hit the lifeboat and it capsized and threw all of the crew into the water. Now these lifeboats were designed to be self-writing and this is the great mystery about the Civil Service No. 7. Why did it not write itself? The lifeboat remained upside down and despite attempts for the men to scramble aboard and cling on, they were soon washed away and washed out of sight in the bad visibility. The crew of the Palm then attempted to be the rescuers themselves as they launched a boat, one of the ship's boats, which was quickly smashed to pieces against the ship's side. So they were unable to render any assistance. By this time, the second lifeboat, the Hannah Picard, had reached the mouth of the harbour, being towed down by the steam pinnace, and they too cast off 
and hoisted the sails and set out in the direction of the wreck. They hadn't gotten very far when they too overturned and all of the men were thrown into the water. But this boat, unlike its larger sister, righted itself and all the men were able to get back aboard. Shortly afterwards, the boat capsized again and some of the men were thrown into the water. Again, it righted itself and the men got back aboard. But this time, the mizzen mast had been washed away and half of the complement of oars and they decided to anchor the boat at that stage. Having gotten the boat back into order, they couldn't proceed at all in the direction of the wreck of the palm. They could see the upturned hull of the civil service number seven. Equally, they couldn't proceed back in the direction from which they came back to Kingstown. So they headed for the only part of the coast that could provide them with any shelter, the little harbour of Black Rock known as Vance's Harbour. Behind me here is Vance's Harbour, where the smaller of the two lifeboats, the Hannah Picard, came ashore. This is at Black Rock, and it's the only place on the coast that could afford them any sort of shelter at the height of the gale. It was said at the time that the waves were washing not only over the little harbour wall, but also over the railway wall. The lifeboat men had great difficulty getting the boat in here, and it was badly damaged in the process, and they got assistance from people on the shore. The boat remained here for some time, where it was worked upon by a team of shipwrights, until it was eventually put back into service. The men were given tickets to go back to the Kingstown uh, by railway from the station master in Black Rock. A great many people had come down to the shore, including many of the relatives of the lifeboat men of the Civil Service Number no. 7, and were waiting at Vance's Harbour as the lifeboat came ashore. The crew of the Hannah Picard, however, had nothing but bad news to give them about the events that had happened out in the bay and the fate of their loved ones. But the gale continued throughout the whole of that day. And right throughout the day and into the night, people walked ashore to see could they find anybody who had possibly survived the dreadful overturning of the lifeboat. However, when dawn broke the next day, they found the dismal sight of bodies littering the shore. And in all, 13 bodies of the 15 were recovered the next day. Two of the bodies weren't recovered for about a week. Throughout Christmas Day and the following day, people could be seen moving about on the wreck of the palm out in the bay. The gale continued unabated right throughout Christmas Day. On St. Stephen's Day, a ship was seen leaving the harbour to go out to attempt a rescue of the crew. This was the SS Teirocht, one of the service vessels of the Irish Lights. And it was commanded by Captain Thomas McCombie. He had attempted to get out into Dublin Bay uh, on Christmas Day. He had been forbidden to go out by Captain Crofton, the harbour master, on Christmas Eve. Uh, Captain Crofton was also uh, one of the commissioners of Irish Lights and he deemed the conditions to be too bad to attempt to risk lives further. Captain McCombie had kept up steam aboard his vessel throughout Christmas Day and made an attempt to get out, but conditions are so bad uh, he was unable to do so. On St. Stephen's Day, however, conditions had abated somewhat. The wind had died down and the Tairock proceeded out into the bay and anchored about a mile away from the wreck. In two trips in one of the ship's longboats down to the wreck, they took off all 19 people on board, including the captain's wife and child. On the second trip down to the wreck, their boat almost capsized. Captain Thomas McCombie brought the Tairock back into Kingstown Harbour and alongside the Carlisle Pier and was given a hero's reception by the great crowd who had assembled. All of the crew of the Palm were accommodated in the Royal Marine Hotel initially. Among them was an Irishman called Thomas McMullen from Belfast, the only English-speaking member of the crew. Two were Swedes, there was one German, and the rest were from the Island Islands in Finland. Also aboard was a 14-year-old lad from Maryham who had stowed away as the ship had left and by the time the ship had reached Liverpool he had been assumed into the crew as a full member. And one thing that's evident from this photograph is how youthful the crew are. I've often wondered what it must have been like to have been a lifeboat man in the 19th century when the boats were propelled by oars and sails only. They must have been extremely tough, dedicated individuals. Frequently they were called upon to row for hours and to row for many miles and to be on station for literally hours on end in extremely arduous conditions. 
I've often wondered also what were the motivations of the lifeboat men. Why did they go out on these very arduous rescue attempts in such dangerous conditions? It certainly wasn't for any monetary reward. All they would have been given was a very small gratuity. I think the answer is that they probably felt that they had to go out to try to attempt to save the lives of their fellow seamen who were in peril, just as lifeboat men do today. There was an enormous public funeral for the lifeboat men that took place on the Saturday following the disaster. The wreck and the lifeboat disaster had occurred on Christmas Eve, which fell on Tuesday. On the following Saturday, an enormous public funeral took place. You can see the crowds beginning to gather and the flag of the Kingstown commissioners at half-mast on the town hall from where the funeral began. Most of the bodies were brought from various churches or from their homes. These are the harbour yard cottages where Henry and Alexander Williams, father and son, the coxswain and ex-coxswain both lived. The funeral cortege left from the town hall here in Kingstown on the Saturday morning and it was the biggest funeral apparently ever seen in this part of Dublin. The route was thronged with people from beginning to end, from the town hall in Kingstown all the way to Dean's Grange Cemetery. The order of the funeral procession was the band of the DMP, then came the men of the Palm who had been rescued, and after that the crew of the Tairacht. Following those came 13 hearses, each drawn by four black horses. En route, the mourners would probably have been able to see the wreck of the Palm, which was quite visible out in the middle of Dublin Bay. The mast had been cut away, and the bowsprit can be seen jutting out from the wreck. They may also have been able to see the upturned hull of the Civil Service No. 7 lifeboat, which by now had washed ashore near Black Rock. There are holes in the side of the lifeboat that had been put there by the Coast Guard and by members of the Dublin Metropolitan Police who were the first to get out to the upturned hull of the lifeboat after it came ashore to see was anybody trapped underneath. Nobody, however, was found. The funeral procession left the town hall and proceeded up Marine Road into Cumberland Street and Old Dunleary and along by the seafront and up Stradbrook Road to Dean's Range Cemetery. It was reckoned that the funeral procession was about a mile long. This is the grave of Henry and Alexander Williams. You can see it's marked with a bronze lifeboat and a bronze anchor. The body of Henry Williams wasn't discovered till about two weeks after the funeral took place. It was discovered off Ireland's eye and the body of Thomas Dunphy was subsequently found near the Poolbeg Lighthouse. Both of those bodies did not have the life jackets on them, which perhaps accounts for the fact that they may have been washed away further from the wreck site. These are the graves of Henry Underhill and John Bartley. Six of the lifeboat men were from Protestant denominations and nine were Catholic. It was the custom at the time in Dean's Grange Cemetery to bury Protestants in a different part of the graveyard to that of Catholics. It's a little sad that while all of these lifeboat men who were united in life in pursuit of a common purpose of the most noble sort, the saving of human life, should be somewhat divided in death. It mentions on these headstones that the ship in question was a Russian ship, the Pam. It was an actual fact from Finland, but Finland at the time of the disaster was part of Tsarist Russia. This is the headstone of John Bartley, who as you can see was aged 45, and was actually one of the older members of the lifeboat crew. These are the graves of Frank and George Sanders, one of the two pairs of brothers who were lost. Frank and George were Methodists. You can see here on the headstone of Frank Sanders that there's an associated tragedy. The widow of Frank Sanders, Frances Elizabeth, was on her way over to Hollyhead to visit her daughter who was in labour. And she was travelling on the mailboat RMS Leinster, which was torpedoed in the last month of the war, and she was tragically lost. You can see also that her daughter who subsequently died in childbirth, is also buried here. 
The carved motif on the headstone of Frank Sanders represents an upturned lifeboat. This one on the headstone of his brother George represents a lifeboat also. You can actually see the sail being hoisted here. George Sanders was aged 31. His wife Susanna, who died in 1947, uh, is buried here with him. Susanna survived her husband by 52 years. She was pregnant at the time of the lifeboat disaster and she subsequently had a baby boy whom she named George. These are some of the graves of the Catholic lifeboat men. Four here, two behind and three more are buried just behind the trees over here. Included in these graves are those of William and Thomas Dunphy, another of the pairs of brothers uh, who were lost. Thomas Dunphy, who's buried here, and his older brother, William, buried immediately behind him, were fishermen who were crew of a fishing smack in Kingstown Harbour. Thomas Dunphy's daughter, Sarah Wall, is buried here with him. She lived to be a great age, 91, which means she would have been about six years of age at the time of the tragedy. So she probably would have had a great recollection of the events. 13 of the 15 lifeboat men who were lost were married. Many had several children. A total of 34 children were left fatherless, including two who were born after the tragedy. A committee was formed under the chairmanship of Adam Finlater, the head of the great Dublin Business House, who was also chairman of the Kingstown Commissioners, for the purpose of organising a fund for the dependence of the lifeboat men. By the following March, a total of £17,000 had been gathered together and the fund was closed. The hearts of people everywhere were touched by the tragedy, both in Ireland and further afield. This is part of an old programme for one of the many concerts and other events that were organised for the Lifeboat Fund. It was found under the stage in the Town Hall in Dunleary when the stage was being moved. It featured a great many of the artists of the day. Almost immediately the widows of the lifeboat men were being given a pound a week as a pension from the fund. Various awards and decorations were given to people who had taken part in the rescue of the crew of the Palm. Captain McCombie was awarded the gold medal of the RNLI, a very rare distinction. He gallantly asserted that he was accepting it both on his own behalf and on behalf of the crew of the Terok who had accompanied him on the rescue of the crew of the Palm. Captain Axel Viren returned to Finland where he became a customs officer with the Russian Customs Service. His daughter Esther Miranda, here a young lady, was rescued with her father when she was a young baby from the wreck of the Palm. Before he left Dublin, Captain Axel Viren advertised the sale of the wreck in the Irish Times. It was sold for £50. It was bought by a carpenter called Gaffney from Blackrock who took a great deal of timber from the wreck and he built many barns and outhouses from this. The main companionway was used as a stairs in this house in Ring's End called Sandefjord. It's made from Cuban mahogany and pitch pine. And some of the panelling from the cabin of the palm was used in the same house. The wreck of the palm remained visible at all stages of the tide until about 1910 when it finally disappeared below the surface only to appear at very low tides. Today, some wreckage of the palm remains on the seabed, just some weed-covered timbers and pieces of iron sticking out of the seabed. In the Maritime Museum in Dunleary, there are several artefacts on view that are connected with the lifeboat disaster. There are also several photographs uh, in connection with the event. There are models of lifeboats and various artefacts that have come from both the lifeboats and from the wreck of the Palm. On view in the Maritime Museum is the nameplate from the stern of the Palm, which was taken from the wreck sometime after the ship went aground. This is a model of the lifeboat Dunleary 2, which was the boat that replaced the civil service number seven after she was wrecked. It was identical to it in virtually every respect, having been built off the same lines. As you can see, she was powered by sails and oars. She had two lug sails and was also powered by 12 oars. 
Uh, it also had two drop keels here, but made purely for sailing and rowing. This model lifeboat here is also in the Maritime Museum and is virtually identical to that of the Hannah Picard, the smaller of the two lifeboats that went out on Christmas Eve. This is the memorial stone to the lifeboat men who were lost and it has all of their names inscribed. It says on it, near this spot during the storm of Xmas Eve 1895, the crew of one of the Kingstown lifeboats embarked on their last mission of mercy in an attempt to reach a wreck. The boat was capsized and all her gallant crew were drowned. Their names are here subscribed. There are a great many descendants of the lifeboat men who were lost, still living in Dunleary. And every year there's a very moving ecumenical prayer service carried out. Was in the year of 95 When 15 lifeboat men from Kingstown died The sea was white with a raging foam When they left their families and their homes All hearts did grieve for those brave men when on Christmas Eve they did not return And eight young men lay on rings and strands No more did they ever walk this land We remember Alexander and Henry Williams Francis and George Saunders Edward Shannon Patrick Parr Edward Crow, John Baker, John Bartley, William and Thomas Dunby, Edward Murphy, James Ryan, Francis MacDonald, Henry Underhill. And we also remember all those who have lost their lives around our coasts during the past year. Merciful Father, protect and bless the crews of all their lifeboats and all who risk their own safety to bring help to others. This is a more recent plaque that was placed on the old lifeboat house when it was refurbished a few decades ago. And on it it says, From this stone boat house in 1895 in a terrible storm, 15 brave men from this lifeboat station rowed out to rescue the crew of a wrecked ship. Their boat overturned and they were all drowned. Their memorial is a rough granite stone nearby with their names engraved. Now it concludes with the words, Their sacrifice is not forgotten. Now I'm full sure that as long as people continue to use the sea and as long as lifeboats continue to go out to try to rescue those who are in peril, that their sacrifice will never be forgotten. So let us try their loved ones' tears For that Christmas day brought only fear Let us go and do good deeds for them.